You're about to hear an audio interview that I conducted with Dr. Joel Wallach, one of the foremost authorities on nutrition and health in the world. Dr. Wallach has degrees in agriculture, animal husbandry, nutrition, and along with advanced degrees in veterinary medicine and naturopathic medicine. Dr. Wallach's experiences are so vast that I could spend hours discussing his credentials and accomplishments that far surpass most physicians that speak on the subject of health and wellness. But I will simply let Dr. Wallach's responses to my questions demonstrate his knowledge about the prevention and reversal of diseases using nutrition. And you will then understand why he is called the Mineral Doctor. Hello, this is Dirk Twine speaking with Dr. Joel Wallach, the Mineral Doctor. Dr. Wallach and I are here to discuss the top 10 leading causes of death among African Americans. However, before we begin, I would like Dr. Wallach to share with us his background and philosophy on nutrition, health, and wellness. Well, thank you, Dirk. I always appreciate your hospitality. And uh, the thing that makes my view different on health is that I have a degree in agriculture. My background is in agriculture. And in the animal industry, we don't have health insurance for animals. And so we learn just how to get rid of health problems and prevent health problems. Now, there's no law requiring doctors to prevent and cure diseases if there are preventions and cures known. And in the animal industry, just from economic purposes, since we don't have insurance, for extended treatment, we learned how to prevent and cure these diseases very rapidly, very economically with nutritional program. Uh, my minor was in field crops and soil, so I learned the physiology and nutritional uh, needs of uh, soil and plants. Went on to veterinary school, and as a veterinary student, long before I actually graduated veterinary school, I was a graduate student and began to take comparative pathology courses, and by the time I graduated vet school, I was already a published and very uh, experienced and accomplished uh, pathologist for both animals and humans. I um, actually worked on various uh, projects projects uh, with Marlon Perkins from the old Mutual Omaha Wild Kingdom show. Um, he got a $24 million grant from the National Institutes of Health back in the 60s to study pollution and nutritional deficiencies in zoo animals that died of natural causes. And to make a long story short, the 1,200-page book that came out of that is in the Smithsonian Institute as a national treasure. And the bottom line of 17,500 autopsies of 454 species of zoo animals and 3,000 human beings is that every animal and every human being who dies of natural causes dies of a nutritional deficiency disease. Went on to school, became a primary care physician as a naturopathic physician in Oregon and, and uh, California. Been licensed since 1982. I was a uh, graduate student and I did my uh, internship and residency in not beginning in 1978. So I've been treating humans uh, since 1978 using nutritional approaches to prevent and reverse diseases. I've been practicing as a licensed uh, physician since 1982 and literally have seen millions and millions of people over the years in over 50 countries teaching them how to prevent and reverse diseases. That is phenomenal, Doc. I think um, what distinguishes you so much, I've found, is your work as a pathologist. I would venture to say that most pathologists may do a few thousand in an entire career, but uh, in the study that you did, which lasted, what, say from 10 to 15 years, um, you did close to 20,000, uh, not to mention some other autopsies that you did uh, soon after that and a few years past that time frame. So I think that is phenomenal and that's what distinguishes you so much from others um, that are in the nutrition arena. You're exactly right. And when you do that many autopsies, and just in that one project, as you said, uh, I had done over 20,000 autopsies, some 17,500 and some change of over 454 species of zoo animals from obviously all over the world, but also 3,000 humans. We did uh, 10 million chemistries, 10 million slides with special stains, looking for pollution, looking for nutritional deficiencies. Bottom line is that every animal and every human being who dies of natural causes, it's very obvious they die of nutritional deficiency. So it does give me a different look. Uh, whereas most medical doctors think everything is caused by genetic defect. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and get started, Doc. Uh, let's look at number one, heart disease. Well, there are many different types of heart disease, uh, Dirk, and uh, none of which are genetic. So that's uh, right out of the chute. We'll just say that uh, none are genetic. Uh, one of the more common ones is a coronary thrombosis, where you get a blood clot in a coronary artery, and it's uh, some bifurcation where the artery gets smaller and divides into two or three. Uh, that blood clot will get stuck, uh, cause an ischemia or a lack of blood blood supply to that portion of the heart, and varying proportions or percentages of the heart muscle will die. Well, uh, if you get minor death of the muscle, uh, maybe 1%, 5%, 10%, you might survive it, depending on where it's at. But if you get a catastrophic, you know, they say, well, he died of a massive heart attack, that's because maybe 50, 75, or 80% of the heart died because of lack of nutrition and oxygen. And this is caused by a 
nutritional deficiency, a very simple nutritional deficiency, or ratio problems of omega-3, 6s, and 9s. I actually sued the FDA on that one to be able to say legally, and this was back in the 90s, that um, you can supplement with omega-3s in, in the proper ratios with omega-3, 6s, and 9s, and significantly reduce the risk of thrombotic stroke, coronary thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and deep vein thrombosis. And so that was kind of a landmark uh, lawsuit against the FDA in federal court. Now, the second most common type of um, heart disease, which can be disabling certainly or, or fatal is atherosclerosis or arteriosclerosis where you actually get scar tissue building up in the walls of the arteries. 1971 I wrote a paper on that based on a lot of the data that had been accumulated in those autopsies where Dirk I compared percentages of plugging of arteries uh, in vegans versus meat eaters and I did special stains with things looking for a uh, percentage of cholesterol, saturated fat, scar tissue, calcium and what I found out was that to make a long story short it's kind of a surprised everybody that the group that had the most atherosclerosis, arteriosclerosis, coronary artery disease, if you will, were vegans. And that's because they were eating oxidized oils in the form of grains that were stored poorly, or they were using oils to stir fry and turning them into trans fatty acids, heterocyclic amines, and acrylamides in literally seconds. And so that was the second type of heart disease. The third most common type of heart disease is congestive heart failure. It's actually the most common cause of heart death uh, in Americans, uh, adult Americans, is congestive heart failure. And it's actually caused by by deficiency of a single vitamin. This was discovered by a Japanese naval surgeon back in the year 1712. So we're talking 300 years ago, Dirk, that we knew the actual cause, prevention, and cure of congestive heart failure. And then is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy heart disease, which is one of the reasons why we have a sudden death in young athletes, uh, middle-aged people, and even seniors, where they seem to have nothing wrong with them. You could do an EKG on them, and 10 seconds later, they would die from a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy heart attack, and this is caused by a deficiency of a single mineral. Okay. Okay, that's very, very interesting, Doc. I think that um, many times people don't realize the severity of what we're talking about here. Uh, we're very casual because we get comfortable taking our physical exams every, every year, and Americans don't realize that the nutritional piece is very, very important. I think you share some information about the nutritional piece that everyone needs to know. Uh, let's move on to the second one, number two, cancer. Well, cancer is a self-inflicted disease. It's not genetic in any way, shape, or form. Uh, for instance, uh, we know that if you eat meat cooked very well done, just the heterocyclic amines that come from burning the fat within the meat and the fat on the outside of the meat, uh, these uh, heterocyclic amines will increase your risk of breast, prostate, and colon cancer by 462%. Not 4%, not 14%, but 462% over those individuals who cook their meat medium or medium rare. So whether I'm at home cooking myself or I'm out, I always get my meat cooked medium rare. If they won't do that, I go to another facility. I will not eat meat that's cooked more than medium rare because it will increase your risk of breast prostate and colon cancer by 462%. Then you get uh, things like people who are restricted financially, the poor will go to these thrift stores and buy you know, week old bread and they contain molds in them, bread molds that contain substances called aflatoxins. And these bread molds actually are not harmless. These aflatoxins, which are uh, produced by particularly a bread mold called aspergillus, actually produce this aflatoxin, which causes liver cancer. And so you shouldn't be eating that kind of stuff. Uh, it's kind of interesting. You can actually turn out the lights and get a black light, which is a UV light like they use in discos and they light yes. up everything. Um, you can flash this black light, slice of moldy bread, and it'll shock you because it'll look like these disco lights. It will fluoresce. You see all that aflatoxin. So you just cut the mold off the bread. That toxin actually spread through the bread and you're still getting the toxin that's going to cause liver cancer. So you need to be aware of that. Then if you eat nitrates and nitrites like you find in deli slices, sandwich meats, sausage, ham, bacon, bologna, salami, pastrami, pepperoni, jerky, corned beef, spam, canned meats, hot dogs, chemical series is found in the last two ingredients in the ingredient list of processed meats. Again, deli slices, sandwich meats, and all these various uh, things that we're used to uh, making sandwiches out of. Those nitrates and nitrites will actually inflame your arteries and contribute to setting up plugged arteries as well as stroke, but they also uh, will increase your risk of prostate, colon, 
cancer, I mean, by hundreds of percent. They want to stay away from those kinds of things. In fact, uh, right now in Chicago, they have a billboard. I think it's like 20 billboards around the Beltway around Chicago that say eating hot dogs causes butt cancer. And um, they have this out there to attract the attention of eight-year-olds. They actually designed that that, um, billboard to um, alert eight-year-olds that what you eat can cause colon cancer and of course is worded to attract an eight-year-old. That's pretty amazing, Doc. Um, Also, getting back to aflatoxins, that same mold that you're talking about, doesn't it occur in peanuts also? Oh, absolutely. Peanuts is a very common source, uh, so I won't eat peanuts. In fact, there's a great event that took place back in the uh, 50s, 58 I believe it was. It was a bad year, it was a drought, and they didn't have enough soybeans to make turkey food. And so it looked like we were going to have a bad year for turkeys uh, for Thanksgiving. And so they imported literally uh, dozens and maybe even hundreds of boatloads of peanut meal from Nigeria. Well, it was all in- infested with this aspergillus fungus. And of course, all this peanut meal was just saturated with this aflatoxin. And again, to make a long story short, months uh, before even the, the babies were hatched, and then as the babies were fed solid food as they were hatched out of the eggs, uh, they were given this turkey food that had this contaminated peanut meal in it and it wiped out that year's entire crop of turkeys for Thanksgiving so we had to get our turkeys from Canada that year. Uh, That information by the way actually helped me solve a mystery in zoos all around the world. Zoos uh, were having a problem with bears. They die before age 30 with liver cancer. It didn't matter if it was the Moscow Zoo or the London Zoo or the New York Zoo or the Washington DC Zoo or the Portland Oregon Zoo. All bears would die before age 30 with liver cancer. The liver cancer they thought well gosh it must be a thing with bears and of course all these people from all the zoos were meeting once a year internationally to have these conferences and you get a thousand pound bear they can eat a lot of food and so they said well how are you feeding your bears we, we can't keep too many bears because they're too expensive they said, well we just go to the thrift stores and we buy the moldy bread for them and i went and checked the moldy bread that they were feeding the bears in the st louis zoo and they all just lit up like disco lights and with the aflatoxin and then we fl- switched them over to dog food and it just stopped uh, liver cancer in the bears overnight so i was very proud of that it took two weeks to figure that one out because i knew about the aflatoxin and uh, one other thing I want to throw in here, another lawsuit I have against the FDA in federal court, which again I prevailed, was that you can supplement with 200 micrograms of selenium. You can actually reduce your rate, uh, your risk of cancer, say colon cancer by 64%, prostate cancer by 69%, breast cancer by 82%, lung cancer, whether you smoke or not, by 39%, just by supplementing with 200 micrograms of selenium. And so I was able to get a, a claim for selenium and cancer to say, that by supplementing with selenium, you can significantly reduce the risk of cancers. Second claim I got on that same subject was by supplementing with selenium, you'll support the body's ability to manufacture anti-cancer substances. And so this was all published, and you can go you know, to our websites and find the docket numbers so there's no doubt that these things were done. So we're very, very proud of this work we've been doing, and, and uh, we just hope that this message gets passed on. We're just glad that uh, you're allowing us to share this with you, Dirk. Well, thank you very much for being here, Doc. Uh, but let's Let's talk about another piece of the uh, cancer puzzle. We've discussed it before, but the dangers of oil, and particularly among African Americans, uh, both for cancer and for heart disease. Let's talk a little bit about the dangers of oils. And most people have been told, and they bought the idea that oils are good for you. They will use extra, 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 virgin, 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 virgin olive oil and coconut oil. They taste good. There's no doubt about it. They taste good. And the doctors wave the Mediterranean diet in front of everybody's face, saying, look, these people live a long time, and they're using olive oil and we want you to use olive oil. Well, they've killed more Americans every year than all the wars put together of our enemies that have killed us, okay? from oils. And oils oxidize in, ex- in the exposure to the air. And these oxidized oils turn into trans fatty acids, heterocyclic amines, and acrylamides, all of which are, are um, free radicals that damage everything you think of. As you say, they, they cause heart disease by inflaming the arteries and causing atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease. They encourage stroke by inflaming the arteries in the brain. They cause kidney failure by inflaming the arteries inside the kidneys, resulting in the need for dialysis. And increase your risk of cancer again by many hundreds of percent. And so oils are extremely dangerous. And you throw in somebody who's using oils as salad dressing or cooking oils, and then they're eating processed meats with nitrates and nitrites, and you're going to get cancer. That combination is a very deadly combination. When people don't understand oxidation, I say, cut 
an apple in half and put the cut surface of the apple up into the air in the atmosphere and check it every half hour, what happens to that apple, Dirk, in a half hour, an hour? Turns brown. Turns brown. Well, is the oil in the apple oxidizing to that's turning it brown? Now, an apple is not uh, thought of as having a lot of oil in it. An, an apple has very little, you know, statistically no oil in it. You don't find any apple oil anywhere, right? But you can see it oxidizing with your naked eye. And so you don't, if you don't think that, that uh, olive oil, coconut oil, sesame seed oil, soy oil, canola oil, if you don't think those oils aren't oxidizing, you're living in la-la land. This is why um, vegetarians have such a hard time because they use a lot of oils for calories because, you know, they're starving for calories when they're eating lots of vegetables and, and uh, things like uh, fruit and so forth. And just uh, for calories and, and mineral deficiencies, they have cravings. They use a lot of oil for calories calories and of course they're oxidized oils and they will kill themselves using oxidized oils. So we're even asking, um, we're even talking about a double whammy when you talk about peanut oil, which a lot of people use because the peanut oil seems to have a higher uh, ability to raise it to high temperatures and not burn. And so people are using the peanut oil. So is it possible that the aflatoxin that you talked about earlier is in the peanut oil also? Is that a double whammy that we're dealing with there? You might get a three for <laughs> Okay. <laughs> you get, you get, um, oxidized oils, you get the acrylamides uh, and aflatoxins, and then you throw in processed meats with nitrates and nitrites, you're getting a, a you know, tree, a threefer. Getting a th it's just a terrible thing. And this is one of the reasons why the African-American community has such a high rate of every kind of cancer you name. It's not genetic, it's by eating these incorrect things. Now, I do want to throw something in here about the Mediterranean diet. When they talk about the Mediterranean diet, it's not to the benefit of the Greeks and the Italians. They live to be an average of 62. Mm, amazing. Less than we do. The, um, the benefits of the Mediterranean diet is seen in the Sardinians, whose average lifespan is 90. Uh, in my book, Immortality, I talk about the difference between the Sardinians and the Greeks and the Italians, and that is that the Sardinians are not farmers. They don't eat They don't eat whole wheat. They don't eat pasta, like the Greeks and the Italians do. They are herdsmen, and they herd primarily sheep and goats, and so they have sheep and goat milk and cheese and sheep and goat meat. They do get sweet potatoes and beets. They drink red wine, and as a result, they live to be 90 on the average, so I, I prefer to eat the Sardinian diet rather than the, quote, Mediterranean diet, unquote, that comes from the Greeks and the Italians. Well, although African Americans have a higher rate of heart disease and cancer than than most Americans, uh, with the growth of the fast food industry in the United States, is that going to change such that all Americans are now eating more fried foods and more more foods that are that are uh, are using oils? And eventually, will that statistic change in a way that most Americans will suffer? from the same things that African Americans are suffering with today. Oh, absolutely. Good point. Um, the peak of American longevity occurred 20 years ago. We've gone backwards ever since. We spend more money for health care than all the nations of the world combined each year. Not, not any nation, more than all nations combined. We spend more for health care. What do we get for that? We're 92nd in the world when it comes to health. There's 91 other countries whose peoples are healthier than us. We're ranked 60th in longevity. There's 59 other countries whose peoples live longer than us. And God forgive us, we rank 41st when it comes to live birth and first month survival of our babies. And so uh, this is happening because people are told to eat certain things, eat lean meat. Well, if you're eating lean meat from a deli that has all these nitrates and nitrites in it, you're in trouble, right? Uh, eat oils instead of butter and cream and lard, and then you have all these uh, free radicals, the trans fatty acids, heterocyclic amines, and acrylamides. And so we're getting a lot of bad advice, and of course the average person has bought into this because it tastes good. It's, uh, it's very seductive. Well, you can eat safely at Kentucky Fried Chicken and McDonald's, and JJ's, you know, fish place. You can eat safely at these places. And I encourage everybody to take their kids there and their grandkids there and teach them how to eat safely because I guarantee you they're going to go there with their friends. And you want your kids and your grandkids to be a good influence on the other guys. For instance, in Kentucky Fried Chicken, you can go there and eat Kentucky Roasted Chicken. Mm -hmm. Very safe, right? You can eat their salad bar and then get out. Okay. Don't eat their french fries, <laughs> right? Don't eat their fried chicken, even the original recipe. And, um, and so you have to teach people to eat safely. Now, the French uh, live 10 years longer than they do. The French are not in the top 20 longevity cultures, but they live 10 years longer than we do. And so when you look at that, you just have to say, well, whatever it is they're doing, we should be doing, right? If they live 10 years longer than us. Well, medical doctors call this the French paradox. They say, those Frenchies are so dumb. They eat a lot of uh, cream and butter and lard and uh, milk and dairy and eggs. They cook and all that stuff. And look at that. They, they live 10 years longer than we do. So we're going to call it the French paradox. It's paradoxical. They're eating all this fat and saturated fat like we're not supposed to eat and cholesterol. And yet they live 10 years longer than us. And so instead of calling it the French paradox, American doctors should give up their ego and say, you know, we made a mistake over all these years. We want to switch our eating, not to the Mediterranean diet like the Greeks.
obviously the Italians, but to the French diet, and overnight will gain 10 years in longevity just doing what the French do. Okay, that's very interesting. So when, when we address the, the issue about the oils, tell me a little bit of, uh, about the difference between its effect on us for cancer versus the effect on us for, for heart disease. Again, you have to appreciate that free radicals change the uh, genes in our cell. And when you start changing the genes in the cells, you, you destroy a process called apoptosis. Apoptosis is a normal behavior of cells that gives a cell a finite lifespan. Uh, for instance, skin cells live 28 days. Every little school kid knows that. Your skin replaces itself every 28 days. Well, what if that goes away? What if your skin doesn't replace itself every 28 days? What if there's no programmed death? What if your skin cells live forever, but they keep having babies? Your skin's going to be 200 foot thick by the time you're 50 years old. Right? right. And so instead of being its genetic limit of maybe an eighth of an inch thick, here suddenly now um, you're, you're in trouble. Same way with your thigh bones your femur. If there's no apoptosis in those osteoblasts, which actually uh, make bone cells, these osteoblasts, if the apoptosis piece is taken away by genetic damage caused by eating these free radicals from oils, they the daughter cells beget granddaughter cells, which beget great-granddaughter cells, but grandma never died. And so that's why you get a, a tumor, a cancer, because they keep having babies, but they don't die. Okay. And so either there is significant reduction of or the elimination of this apoptosis feature which causes tumors. Okay. All right. Let's go to number three. Let's talk about stroke. Okay. Well, stroke is kind of a, a twofer. Uh, you have the deficiency of omega-3, 6s, and 9s, or a ratio problem between omega-3, 6s, and 9s. Then you can also have inflammation of the arteries, which cause partial clogging. For instance, if somebody has a 40, 50, 60 percent blockage in their artery walls because they've been eating a lot of uh, deli meats at lunchtime every day, uh, so it's only 60 percent clogged. Well, but if you're deficient in omega-3s or have a ratio problem between omega-3s, 6s, and 9s, you're more likely to get a coronary thrombosis than if your arteries are 100% clear. Okay, so those two can kind of run together. So you can get thrombotic stroke, you can get thrombotic coronary thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, deep vein thrombosis, all caused by the same thing. Ratio problems between omega-3, 6s, and 9s and our inflammation of the arteries. So it's a, a combination of things. So you have to watch it. We've, we've created all these monsters and the interesting thing to me, Dirk, is that the top 20 longevity cultures are all third world cultures. There's not a single industrialized nation or first world country that's in the top 20 longevity cultures. They don't have doctors or hospitals or clinics or pharmacies or pharmaceuticals, yet they outlive us. Uh, they live to be an average of 90 in a healthful way. We live to be an average of 75 in a sickly way. So you would think the doctors would step back and say, well, what is it we're doing to yourself? Why do we have so much coronary artery disease? Everybody's exercising, everybody's eating whole grains, and they can't figure it out because they have no experience, no training in nutrition. That's terrible. It's a very, very unfortunate circumstance. Uh, let's go on to number four, Doc. Accidents. Okay, well, accidents can happen for a lot of reasons. Number one, um, if you have uh, pain in your joints and you're walking funny, maybe you need a cane, you don't have one, and you trip on the rug and fall down. And uh, you can fracture a hip, and then two weeks later, you die from a thrombosis, a stroke, because you had 18 different deficiencies. You can also fall down in an accident um, because you have a blood sugar problem. You have diabetes, which isn't under control. And your blood sugar drops, and you get dizzy or lightheaded or pass out, and you fall down, and again, you can fracture a hip and, and, and die. You can also have what's called narcolepsy. In the old days, today it's called insulin intolerance or hyperinsulinemia, where you have high levels of blood insulin. You can, you can also be called reactive hypoglycemia. We have a big meal and you get drowsy. And this happens to a lot of people. They go out to eat, they eat a big meal, they have a big high sugar dessert, and the elevated circulating insulin knocks their blood sugar down real low and they just go to sleep. Well, you're driving, that's not good. That's not good at all. <laughs> they cross the highway and ran head on into a truck, that kind of stuff. And some are not so dramatic, they just single car accidents, run into a tree, uh, or they're sitting in the car in the garage because they went to sleep, and uh, they have the garage closed engine still running the diet carbon monoxide poisoning and uh, those are the sort of things that get people in trouble and it's all nutritional deficiencies absolutely so it's it's pretty um pretty interesting because what ends up happening we i guess for lack of better words diagnosing the problem as being simply an accident when in reality the nutritional side was the actual cause of it and people end up missing the point okay well let's look at number five uh, diabetes. Well, diabetes is one of my favorites because we learned 70 years ago it's not genetic. It's a simple deficiency of minerals 
and a damage, a specific type of damage to the cell walls. Elevated blood sugar is not diabetes. It's a symptom of diabetes. And just managing your blood sugar is not going to save you from diabetes. You'll still die 25 years early and they'll cut your legs off, you go blind. They say, well, I can't understand it, Frank. He was really careful about his blood sugar and kept it, you know, below 100 all the time and he died of complications of diabetes. How'd that happen? Well, that's because lowering your blood sugar doesn't solve the diabetes problem because it's a, it's a disease of the cell walls. And your cell walls, every cell wall in your body, whether it's your brain cell, liver cell, kidney cell, muscle cell, cartilage cell, doesn't matter. Every cell wall in your body has two layers, two one cell thick layers, and in between those two layers is fluid. It's actually a fluid. It's 85% cholesterol. Ah. Your normal cell wall is 85% cholesterol. You notice I didn't talk about cholesterol causing stroke and heart disease and stuff like that. It has nothing to do with it. We can talk about that later. But 85% of the thickness of your cell wall is a semi-fluid called cholesterol. It's kind of like egg white is the consistency. Right? Okay. Kind of slimy stuff. And that allows the good stuff to get into your cell and the bad stuff to get out. When you have diabetes, that liquid in between the two layers in your cell walls turns into margarine, turns into a solid. Ah. And the good stuff can't get in. That's why people say, my blood sugar is so high, how come I'm tired all the time? Because this sugar can't get into the cell for energy. So you're starving to death for calories even though your blood sugar is high. Also, your cholesterol tends to go up when you have um, diabetes and doctors say, well, that's incre- that's diabetes causes an increase in risk of heart disease. And they're talking about the increase in, in cholesterol levels. Their statement is not true. But elevated blood cholesterol does occur when you have diabetes because the cholesterol can't get into the cell where it's supposed to go because the, the cell wall is turned into margarine. So at any rate, you have two problems you have to deal with. Number one, you have to change the diet and uh, rebuild the cell walls. You have to then supplement properly to give those minerals to resensitize the cell walls to insulin. And then everything works. A lot of people will take those because it was written up in the 1960s uh, that they had discovered the cause of type 2 diabetes. And of course, medical doctors say, well, that's just in animals. Here, you can take a diabetic, brittle diabetic, and you give them these minerals, and nothing happens. That's because they still haven't dealt with the cell walls. And, you know, you and I have been working together long enough, Dirk, you know, when people have diabetes, they say, yeah, you got to give up sugar, but you also have to give up fried foods and processed meats with nitrates and nitrites and no oils. And that's because you got to rehab those cell walls. you got to get rid of anything that's free radicals are going to oxidize the cell walls. We've also talked about giving up both fruit and fruit juice, particularly initially in the program, uh, because that sugar will also raise the blood sugar levels, and they have the same problem, whether it's a cookie or candy, cakes or pies, the fruit and the fruit juice must be eliminated also initially in the program until we're able to get them back to a level that they can process sugar at some point. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, uh, You have to give up uh, fruit juices, dried fruit, fresh fruit, agave syrup, maple syrup, corn syrup, things like um, molasses, honey. People say, well, that's natural. Yeah, but if you have damaged cell walls and you're deficient in these minerals, you're going to find that it doesn't matter how well you control your blood sugar, uh, you're eating what you think is normal. You know, your doctor's told you to eat whole grains because it it absorbs more slowly. Do not do that when you have diabetes. What I'm finding is I just saw a commercial two days ago on TV about the insulin pump. And uh, they made it a very exciting commercial. It was just lots of fun going on. Everybody was partying, they were dancing, they were swimming, they were doing everything. And they said, oh, you can eat anything you want and you can do whatever you want as long as you have your insulin pump. And it's amazing to me, and I've seen it within my family, I've seen it uh, within uh, associates, where their medical doctors told them as long as you keep track of your blood sugar levels and take your medication as I recommend, you can have whatever you want in moderation. The problem with moderation is what moderation means to you is different from what moderation means to me. And uh, what you teach basically is that both the sugar and the starchy high carb foods need to be eliminated until the body is brought back into balance. Is that correct? You're exactly right, Dirk. Very well said. And um, this is one of the reasons why we're going backwards in longevity. Again, 20 years ago, we peaked in longevity. We've lost as much as 12 years of average lifespan. Okay? Wow. Following the doctor's instructions. Remember, we ranked 92nd in healthfulness, 60th in longevity, and 41st in live births and first month survivability of our babies because of the doctor's advice. And when it comes to health, the doctor is the last person to listen to, particularly in diseases like diabetes which are just simple nutritional deficiency diseases. Once you are on the right track, you're eating properly or supplementing properly so you have everything you need, what's going to happen here is you're able to kind of go back and eat reasonable amounts of 
fruit and fruit juices. If you're not gluten intolerant, you can have a slice of whole wheat bread. If you are a gluten intolerant, you have to eat bread made from buckwheat, which is not wheat, and, and, and rice and stuff like that. So you do have to change if you're a gluten intolerant person uh, significantly. But you can go back to eat a certain amount of that as long as you're supplementing properly. Remember, it's a combination of problems. If you're deficient and you're eating improperly, that's, that's a deadly combination. And so diabetics have to really pay attention to their diet, particularly in the, in the early stages of rehabilitation. Yeah. So their diet should be basically a protein source and green vegetables that's primarily. That's it. 99% vegetables and because uh, they can have yellow vegetables too. Things like tomatoes and and so forth. Um, they should stay away from potatoes initially, but they can go back to, and not fried potatoes. Uh, they can have baked potatoes and butter. That comes later, not baked potatoes and margarine. That comes later. And another piece that uh, people forget are salad dressings, which are made from oils, right? And people say, oh, I just, I can't eat salads without my um, wishbone salad dressing or my Hidden Valley or my Newman's Own or whatever it might be or I make my own with extra, extra, extra virgin, virgin, virgin <laughs> olive oil They're direct from Sicily, right? And um, th these are killers. These are killers. Um, and then you throw in the fact that they're nutritionally deficient. And here's where we have a different concept with animals, Dirk, being a veterinarian and a physician. In the animal industry, we know, we've known for a hundred years that the animal food was deficient. You know, this farm might have 14 minerals in what they grew there. This next farm over might have eight. The next farm over might have 27. And so we level the playing field in animals by giving them pellets every day. You know, like a, a classroom rabbit has these little alfalfa pellets. Uh, we'll give them all the known essential nutrients for rabbits in those pellets to level the playing field. And whatever nutrition was in the alfalfa is value added. We don't pay attention to it. We know that each pellet is perfect because we put it in there. And anything they get of nutritional value in the alfalfa is value added, not dependent upon. And people will tell me, well, alfalfa has such long roots, it picks up all the minerals. Well, it picks up all the minerals that are in the soil in which it was grown. Alfalfa only needs three minerals, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium. Everything else the alfalfa gets, it gets out of the atmosphere. Nitrogen, carbon, uh, sun's energy, and so forth and uh, doesn't need more than three minerals. Now, if it's there, the alfalfa will soak it up. But if it's not there, and if you are you prepared to analyze every batch of alfalfa sprouts to see how many minerals are in there at 2500 bucks a whack that's pretty expensive then you throw in your salad dressing which is made from oil you're in trouble and so we have to be more intelligent for ourselves um, i kind of find it interesting i always ask people dirt do you have a dog say, oh yeah i have this dog i said would you feed him tail scraps? oh no my vet says i can't feed him tail scraps because table scraps will make him fat and he'll get arthritis and he gets uh, diabetes and all kinds of stuff when we feed him table scraps. Well, then my question to you, sir, is how come you eat and you feed your kids, your grandkids, food that will kill a dog? <laughs> That's the usual answer. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I never thought of that. It's so unfortunate, Doc. Uh, the medical community really doesn't have the knowledge about nutrition that they need to have. However, the general public, the average person, will ask them questions about nutrition, and they don't really have the expertise. And so, literally, they're killing people with the advice that they're given. That's exactly right, and it should be considered a felony for a medical doctor to give nutritional advice. It should be considered a felony, because every time they would say things like, I want you to restrict salt, salt has two essential nutrients in it, sodium and chloride. You can't have nerve impulses without sodium and chloride. You can't move water around your body without sodium and chloride. There's like hundreds of enzyme reactions in your body that require sodium and chloride as cofactors. You can't make stomach acid to digest you know, proteins and absorb B12 and other minerals and stuff without stomach acid. And you can't build stomach acid in your, your stomach without chloride, sodium chloride, right? And so it's just absolutely crazy. Uh, that um, doctors will uh, will do that. Of course, the average lifespan of doctors is 56. Why do you want to listen to any advice from doctors when it comes to healthfulness and, and long life? Their average lifespan, according to their own studies, their own studies, Dirk, is 56. It's amazing. And and uh, I've searched and searched looking for studies to justify them telling people not to eat salt. And I have not been able to find any studies that uh, says that we should not eat salt. Well, the reason why they give that advice goes back to like 1910 when they have began to build devices to, to monitor blood pressure. They recognized that blood pressure could be a clinical problem. And some clever doctor, and I forget his name, I should remember the guy's name because he's killed a lot of people. I need to go back and look that up. He wrote a paper saying, look, 
if you could restrict people's salt and dehydrate them, don't you know, instead of giving them eight glasses of water a day, give them two and cut their salt, blood pressure goes down. Well, of course it will. You reduce the amount of oil in a front end loader hydraulic system, the pressure goes down, you can't lift up the bucket. That's why there's so much erectile dysfunction, following the doctor's uh-huh. advice. Can't lift up the bucket. Oh, uh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody home. And so uh, with diabetics, are we having that challenge in terms of the circulatory system is being damaged by having diabetes also? Is that a neuropathy of diabetes? No. Okay. They happen quite commonly together Okay. because nobody's deficient in a single nutrient. For instance, the only time you're going to find a single nutritional deficiency is in a laboratory experiment with rats and mice and monkeys and rabbits and guinea pigs. Because you can make a perfect diet, their pellet will be perfect. Everything in there except one nutrient, one amino acid, one vitamin, one mineral. And then you know exactly what deficiencies occur when you have a, you know, you get 10,000 rats and you give them a diet deficient in one mineral. You know, in six months' time, you'll know exactly all the deficiencies occur from that one mineral. Okay. Well, out on the street, when you look at people out there, thousands walking by in downtown Atlanta or Washington, D.C. I just came from New York. I mean, there's millions of people in New York walking down. You look at them. And I can see, being a pathologist and a doctor for 35 years, I look at these people from a different way, and you know they're all eating differently. Even if they're in the same family, and Mama puts down six platters on the, on the dinner table, they don't all eat the same way in the same family at the same meal. Okay? And so when you have somebody who has neuropathies, it's a back problem, but is it not unusual for somebody who's 65 years old who gets diabetes to also have deficiencies that will cause degenerative disc disease and neuropathies? Okay. When they say diabetic neuropathy, it's just a coincidence that they're occurring at the same time. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Let's go to the next one. Chronic lower respiratory disease. Chronic respiratory disease. Well, you have asthma. You have uh, COPD, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, you can get uh, chronic bronchitis. And these all have a similar basis. Um, one of the questions I always ask people is uh, do you have a history of chronic bronchitis or asthma? Do you have any history of COPD or any respiratory problems? They'll say, yeah, when I was a kid, up until I became a teenager, when I was a kid, I just had asthma all the time. My mom running me to the doctor all the time, and I was on these inhalers and taking these pills. I just carry my inhaler with me now uh, in case I have, uh, you know, I get dust or I exercise, I might have an asthma attack. And... um, there's a new drug on the market, Spiriva or whatever it is. You know, they, they take that and it controls it. Well, it's actually a chemical that, that dilates the bronchi. That's a chemical that's kind of opening the door of your bronchi, opening them up so you can get more air through there, but it doesn't stop the actual cause of the chronic bronchitis or the, or the asthma or the COPD. And so you have to take these nutrients in optimal amounts, and then you can wean off those inhalers and the drugs like Spiriva and so forth uh, to get you know get rid of those drugs that are nasty side effects. And you get rid of it. I, I've seen kids get rid of asthma in anywhere from 10 to 14 days. Adults who had as, adult asthma for 14 years, uh, within four to six weeks, it's gone. Just getting on a gluten-free diet and supplementing with the 90 cents nutrients, which includes the omega-3, 6s, and 9s, which are necessary to produce a um, kind of a short-lived hormone called prostaglandin. It's actually a, a category of hormones which is made just by about every tissue in the body uh, that makes these prostaglandins. They all have a different um, purpose. The ones in the lungs, DERP, are produced to keep the bronchi dilated. When you don't make enough of these prostaglandins, your bronchi just automatically closed down. Well, the raw material to make these prostaglandins are cholesterol and omega-3s. Okay. Cholesterol and omega-3s. So if you have, for instance, a gluten intolerance where you have damage to your small intestine because you have a gluten intolerance, not a wheat allergy, but a gluten intolerance, which is different. Again, we can talk more about that in detail later if you want. When you have a gluten intolerance, the lining of your intestine loses as much as 85% of its absorptive surface. Doctors might call this leaky gut syndrome, um, celiac disease, colitis, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease. Ulcerative colitis, uh, Crohn's disease, diverticulitis, appendicitis, all those are the same disease, just different degrees of severity and by random chance different locations. I've seen people with all, all of those diseases at the same time because it's the same disease. And the first question I a- ask them is, well, do you have any history of chronic respiratory problem, bronchitis, asthma? Oh, man, I had terrible asthma. And if I don't watch my diet, I, my asthma comes back. 
Do you have any skin problems? Yeah, I've had eczema, dry skin, dermati you know, dermatitis, um, psoriasis all my life. Uh, that tells you you're not absorbing enough omega-3s. You, your lungs can't make those prostaglandins. You get this chronic respiratory disease. So, uh, firstly, any respiratory disease, uh, the essential fatty acids play a key role in terms of reversing that condition. So we want to make sure that someone is, that has any kind of respiratory condition taking sufficient amount of essential fatty acids. Yeah, and again, I always worry, you know, we talk about specific nutrients because people, you know, they acquire single nutrients. Well, I've got respiratory disease, so I'm going to take a large amount of omega-3s. Right. And they'll get some benefit, but it won't be perfect, and they'll die of something else. Right. And you always want to take the 90, of course, you want to take the, we call the 90 for life, you want to take the 90. And this includes 16 minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 essential amino acids, and three essential fatty acids, including the omega 3s and 6s and 9s and the proper ratios. And if you do that and take some extra omega 3s when you have these things, you'll be blessed with very rapid turnaround, particularly respiratory diseases respond very, very quickly. Okay, great. Let's look at the next one. Uh, number seven, kidney disease. Well, most of the time, Dirk, when you have kidney disease, kidney failure, there's nothing wrong with your kidney. It sounds like an oxymoron. How can there be nothing wrong with your kidney? And doctors are saying you have kidney failure. Well, they're looking at the percentage of filtration capacity. And of course, uh, your kidney's like a bathtub. When you take a shower or a bath, and you've been working out in the yard and you have leaf debris on you and dust and so forth, and you're using a, a high lather soap, and uh, the soap scum and the leaf debris and you know, hair is getting on the drain, the tub slows down in draining as well as some of them just stop. Now, are you going to call the plumber and have him come in and replace the tub, all your indoor plumbing and all the sewers outside because there's a little bit of silt on your drain? No, you reach down, you take the hair and the soaps come off and it drains. When you have kidney failure, 99% of the time there's nothing wrong with your kidneys. The little artery called an afferent artery, the artery that carries the dirty blood into the filtering unit, which is called the glomeruli in the kidney, this little artery, which is 100,000 times smaller than a diamond of a human hair, Oh my goodness. There's billions of these little afferent arteries in your kidneys which carry the dirty blood to be filtered into the filtering unit. Well, if those little arteries are plugged, you can't get the dirty blood into the filtering unit, so the filtering capacity begins to go down. Nothing wrong with the kidney, but the artery's been plugged. Okay. okay. So that's how that happens. And of course, uh, what we learned how to do was uh, support healthy blood flow through those little blocked arteries by adding a program to that. And, and uh, we actually figured that out how to do it. And, and we were able to actually prevent people getting on dialysis and, and we get people off of dialysis very quickly. In addition, when those arteries are plugged, even though they're tiny little arteries, unlike the major arteries, uh, it still will cause your blood pressure to go up. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. There's two reasons for that. Number one, just because of the obstruction itself, your heart has to work to push blood for those obstructed arteries. You've got massive amounts of them. And there, there's a whole field of these little arteries called PAD, peripheral artery disease. And uh, that will make your blood pressure rise just because the, the little arteries are plugged and you can't get blood through them. But also, when that happens, the glomeruli, the little filtering units in the kidney, release a hormone called renin, R-E-N-I-N. -E and the entire purpose of renin is to raise your blood pressure to try and drive more blood through that blocked artery. And so um, doctors will call this genetic blood pressure. That's why you see um, the, the term genetics uh, used for uh, the, the high blood pressure problem in the black community because you can take all the drugs you want you're going to have a difficult time controlling that type of blood pressure because the drugs are not designed to override the effect of the renin hormone. So uh, I guess uh, taking your blood pressure is one way of determining if, if those plugged arteries are the problem with you. We recommend all 90 essential nutrients and additional things that will help to promote healthy blood flow through the arteries, which would include all of the arteries in your body, which may in long term prevent problems like uh, stroke even. Exactly. Well, um, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story here. Um, I have a very good friend now uh, who had a inoperable terminal aortic aneurysm, had a year to live, very wealthy guy, very nice man. And um, he just found one of my old audio cassette tapes in an in a antique store. And he called the 800 number that was on there. It was a dead number because it was, you know, 20 years old. So he has his younger brother call the company. And he said, we want some of them minerals talked about on that audio cassette tape. Dead doctors don't lie. And so he starts taking the minerals. And he goes in for a physical in three months. And his seven-centimeter 
uh, aortic aneurysm, which is supposed to be terminal and inoperable, went away in three months. Wow. And so we got to talking together, and, and um, he says, well, how come it, it reversed him? I said, well, because it's, it's not genetic. It's a simple mineral deficiency disease. And, um, and then about a year later, he calls me up again. He says, well, I had high blood pressure because my renal arteries, the arteries that go from the aorta to the kidney, were blocked. Doctors, he said, when you when you get to where you're feeling better, we can do surgery safely and put a stint in those arteries that come from the A artery to the kidney. Well, they tested him and they said, well, your arteries are to the from the A artery to the kidney are clear now. What happened? <laughs> well, because when you when you solve the A artery problem, it also survive, you know it also solved the problem of arteries in the brain, um, in the coronary arteries in the kidney and everything, and that's the beauty of the nutritional approach. Um, if you do something, for instance, you put a stent in a coronary artery, it deals with one millimeter of artery length. What about the other 10,000 miles of arteries in your body? It doesn't do that, but when you do the nutritional approach, it clears them all. Let's clarify what a stent is, Doc. What exactly does that do? A stent is like a little spring. If, if you've ever seen the little spring that's in a ballpoint pen, yes. that's what a stent is. It can be metal, it can be plastic, it can be fiberglass, or some kind of fiber. And basically what they do is they put it in an artery where you have some blockages, usually 60% or more blockage. It's causing eddies and turbulence inside your artery because you have it's like a boulder in a, in a stream. Mm -hmm. And basically what the stent does is it dilates that one millimeter of arteries so that that turbulence goes away. Well, if you have blockage in one millimeter of a, car of a coronary artery, the odds are you got blockages in your eyes and resulting in glaucoma. You got blockages in your brain, which is causing vascular dementia. You have blockages in your kidney, which cause loss of kidney function. You can have PAD or blockages in your leg arteries causing numbness and um, bruising on your legs, all kinds of ulcers on your legs that won't heal. And so when we do the nutritional approach to a vascular problem, whether it's a thrombosis or arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis or it's aneurysms, it actually, I can legally say, supports and promotes maintenance repair in every mile of artery in your body and vein in your body. It's just a miracle to do it nutritionally. Okay, that's super. Uh, let's go on to the next one. Number eight, homicide. Okay, well, there's a very interesting study. It was done... Um, in Texas. They had two adjacent counties, two counties that were, you know, right next door to each other. In one county, they had the highest rate of domestic violence and, and violent crime, gun crime in Texas, and the other adjoining county had none. Approximately the same population, the same demographics of Hispanics and, and blacks and whites and so forth, all in these same counties. And yet one had no domestic violence and, and violent crime, particularly gun crime, and the other one had the highest rate in the state of Texas. Well, they found out it was a natural supply of lithium in the drinking water in the county that had no violence. Lithium is not a drug. You know, psychiatrists and psychologists have been turning it into a prescription drug, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, whatever it was. It goes back to a place called Lourdes, France. In Lourdes, France, there's a, a artesian well. has a pool or a little pond next to it. And for thousands of years, they knew that this pond, this well, if you would, would cure people that had emotional problems, whether they're violent, anxiety, bipolar, we call it bipolar today, depression, uh, all kinds of stuff like that, violent behavior, and people go there and drink that water and, and soak in that water, they were cured. And so in the early 20th century, doctors had that water analyzed and they found out it was rich in the trace mineral lithium. And so okay. lithium supplementation will eliminate this kind of behavior. Another thing, there's a wonderful study done because of the terrible high rate of suicides in military personnel that come back to the United States after serving in, in the war zones. Well, um, what they did was they had been taking blood from these guys, you know, like every six months in their three, four, five, six, eight, ten, twenty 20 years in the military. And when they would commit suicide, they went back and looked at their blood. And almost all of them had a severe omega-3 essential fatty acid deficiency. Ah, okay. very interesting. And so, again, violence can have multiple causes. You can have a blood sugar problem. People get crazy when uh, drugs... Uh, but uh, sugar acts like a drug in people who are deficient in certain minerals and B vitamins. Okay. Okay, so all of this affects how your brain works and your self-controls and your ability to be civil and so on. Okay, great. Well, let's move on to uh, number nine, septicemia. Well, septicemia translates to infection in your blood. And this can be caused by just poor personal hygiene. You get a little scratch instead of washing it off with soap and water. You don't. And you get a, you get a blood infection, which can be fatal. 
uh, can get into your brain, your heart, your lungs, and cause death. Uh, also, septicemia is caused by going to doctors. Um, you've all heard of MRSA, which is methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, so Staphylococcus, which is a very resistant bug anyway, but, but it also uh, can become resistant to antibiotics and uh, gets in your bloodstream, usually in hospitals. Uh-huh. Okay, And that's because doctors don't wash their hands after they go potty. They wear the same filthy white coat from room to room to room, same filthy shoes, trousers, pantyhose from room to room to room, carrying peep, poop, blood, pus, not gunk, every filthy thing you can think of, viruses, bacteria from room to room to room. As a result, the Center for Disease Control came out in 1998, Dirk, and said, each year in America, each year in America, medical doctors infect 2 million people in hospitals. Unbelievable. Okay, and these are infections that require the person to have an extra stay there. Another might, might be another three weeks, another month, another six months. Of those 2 million people that are infected each year by doctors just having poor personal hygiene in between patients, guess what? 90,000 of those people die every year. Oh, my goodness. 90,000 die in hospitals each year from infections given to them by doctors. Okay? Unbelievable. Now, what would happen... If some foreign country were to lob a rocket over here with, you know, biological weapons that have bacteria that cause epidemics and plagues, and they kill 90,000 Americans, what would, what would we do to that other country? We'd go to war, probably. We'd go, well, not probably. We'd go, I guarantee we went to <laughs> war with, you know, Afghanistan and Iraq, over 3,000. Went to war with Japan, over 3,000, where they bombed Pearl Harbor, right? If a foreign country kills two or three people, you're not going to go to war over that. But when you're talking about 90,000, we're going to raise an army. We're going to wipe that country out, right? I mean, it's going right. to be nothing but pebbles. There ain't going to be a living soul left in that country. Well, when you get um, one group of people who are a protected monopoly and they have insurance, it's a deadly combination. Absolutely. And these infections, the septicemia, they kill 90,000 people a year. They damage, wound, and bankrupt 2 million people a year because of their bad hygiene, personal hygiene. Now, in a pig barn, it's a federal law that you have to disinfect your boots, wash your hands, clean up your, you know, wear sterile coveralls in between each pig pen. Absolutely. We treat pigs in a barn better than we treat humans in a hospital. And doctors get a walk because they have insurance. And they say, well, you know, we're sorry mama died, but here's my card. Uh, you know, call my office manager. They'll direct you to my insurance agent, and they'll settle with you. The doctor gets a walk. I, I think using that same philosophy, we should give every gangbanger, just turn them back on the streets and give them a, an insurance card and say, hey, every time you kill somebody, give their survivors your insurance card, and insurance will pay them, and everybody be happy. Yeah, neither one of them makes sense. Yeah, neither. Well, why, <laughs> Absolutely. Why, well, why do we let doctors have a walk with these statistics, and we wouldn't do it for gangbangers in a foreign country? Very, very unfortunate circumstance. Very, criminal. very criminal. Crim- absolute criminal. Let's look at the last one. Now, this one has moved down over the last five years, uh, but it's still a very, very deadly condition, HIV AIDS. Okay, HIV, of course, um, the awareness came out during the 80s, and people changed their sexual um, habits. They began to wear condoms and protect themselves. But still, you have to deal with the people who develop AIDS. And you'll find that, that there's an enormous amount of research, ironically enough, done by the University of Georgia. In Athens, Georgia, there's a guy by the name of Taylor who's been working on this since the 1980s and probably, I don't know, 30 years. He found that by supplementing with selenium, you can prevent HIV from converting and mutating into full-blown AIDS. You have people who, for instance, you look at two black athletes, Arthur Ashe and Magic Johnson, both of whom had HIV. And Arthur Ashe, great tennis player, dies of his HIV because it converted to AIDS and he died very rapidly from AIDS. Then you have Magic Johnson who was forced to retire from basketball. He was still able to play, but they were afraid if he'd scratch somebody, he'd transmit HIV to him. None of the other players wanted to play with him anymore because of that possibility of getting knocked in the head or being, you know, collide and having a tooth go into him and get blood, his blood on you and so forth. And so they forced him to retire. And because of supplementation, he's been 20 years, he's still alive. He's never converted to AIDS. He's, just, he's still HIV positive, but he's never converted to AIDS just by supplementing with one mineral. 30 years worth of research on it, no doubt about it, as predictable as gravity. And so um, using nutrition and possibly using other natural healing modalities do you think it's possible that we may be able to eliminate that virus completely from the human body? Uh, that's a hard question to answer, um, but I can tell you that nobody should die of AIDS if they use the proper supplement programs. 
Okay. See, nobody should die of AIDS because they can have HIV for 100 years. Yeah. HIV doesn't kill you. It's only when it, when it mutates to AIDS. And the supplementation of selenium prevents that. And so maintaining a high level of antioxidants is very important. Yes, but specifically selenium. Okay. Very specifically selenium. And high level of antioxidants is very good for anybody, certainly, and certainly people with chronic viral infections. But you must appreciate that selenium in the medical industry is thought of as a poison. They still don't understand that it's an essential nutrient. Now, personally, I weigh 162 pounds, and I take in one milligram of selenium a day. That's 1,000 micrograms. The, the government recommends 60 micrograms because they know nothing about nutrition. The National Science Foundation, they always kind of err on the side of less because they figure you're going to get some from your food, which is a really a stupid approach because um, many people go months without getting any one microgram of selenium. Plants don't need it. How much liver do you eat? None. Okay. That's where animals <laughs> store selenium is in their liver, right? In the old days, when people would eat liver two, three times a week, it, you were getting plenty of selenium that way, right? Okay. Well, now almost nobody eats liver in first world cultures because they look at that, well, everybody knows that filters the body and there's bad stuff in there. Well, yeah, but there's also good stuff in there. That's where the B12 is, that's where the copper is, that's where the zinc's at, that's where the selenium's at, that's where the vitamin C is stored in the body. And so the liver is an enormous source of, of uh, wonderful nutrients. That's why if, if you go back to these third world cultures or these hunter-gatherer societies and cultures that are still in existence, you go back to the caveman days, why is it that the hunters were always the most robust people in the community? That's because they got to eat the heart and the liver. Everybody else had to eat what was left over, right? Okay. They were getting all these nutrients that nobody else was getting. So even when we see wild animals that are carnivores, like the lion, it seems as if that's the, they attack the um, uh, and eat the organ pieces of the animal when they get them down first. Absolutely. They'll open them up and they'll eat the liver. They'll eat the liver and the heart and the lungs and the kidneys. Uh, intestines, they go for the internal organs. Absolutely, they love that. And uh, th that's if that's just instinctive or they're going for it because it tastes better, because there's minerals in it, or there's a lot of blood in the liver compared to everything else, uh, softer, easier to chew, whatever. There's multiple reasons, I'm sure. But uh, the lions who figure out how to eat the liver um, do better than the lions that don't. Okay. Well, let's uh, do a brief summary here. So basically, all of the diseases and conditions that we've talked about so far, uh, you've, all, you've told us how the essential nutrients are all uh, preventative, uh, but it also is helpful if we have the condition to be able to reverse it if we're on a complete nutritional program that contains all of our essential minerals and nutrients in general. What are those essential nutrients again, Doc? Well, first of all, you, I want to congratulate you, Dirk, because you're exactly right. Um, these diseases are 100% preventable and they're 100% reversible with nutrition. Now, that means many things. You have to change your diet, get rid of the bad stuff, right? You have to supplement properly, regardless of how well you think you eat, because even organically grown plants require only three minerals. Okay, organic, when you say something certified organic, it doesn't um, certify that it has all the essential nutrients, which are 60 minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 essential amino acids, 3 essential fatty acids. Again, 60 minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 amino acids, and 3 essential fatty acids. Now, you note that two-thirds of the 90 essential nutrients are minerals. Plants only need three, we need 60. So if you're eating a pretty good slice of organically grown, multigrain bread, baked in the church after church services by the pastor's wife with love, <laughs> you're still 57 short. Okay. Yeah. So it's very, very, very important. When we look at people that, particularly in America, uh, they're suffering with stress, anxiety, depression, uh, grief, all of these various conditions, uh, when we look at that, uh, what I ask you is, Will those kind of conditions affect people that have, say, heart disease and cancer more so than the other diseases? Is it, is it a specific area uh, because we are a highly stressed country? Is there a specific disease or certain diseases that would be more affected by that environment also? Well, there's a universal global pressure put on your body when you're under stress. 
Yeah, I think everybody's heard of they go into a fight or flight mode, uh, stand to defend themselves or run like crazy, get away from whatever the enemy is. This sets things into motion. Number one, your metabolism goes up, your heart rate goes up, you require uh, more fuel, and you, to burn fuel safely, you require more nutrients. And so if you're deficient in nutrients that are required to burn fuel, you're not going to burn fuel. If you um, are deficient in the nutrients that are required for normal brain function and behavior, you're going to have abnormal uh, behavior at this time when you're alarmed. And you see so many people do crazy things, uh, just like this fellow who um, shot up the movie theater, you know, Batman movie, and he had been getting worse and worse and worse, it looks like, over time. And he was doing graduate work in a medical school as a neurologist going for his PhD as opposed to a medical degree. And he was obviously deranged because he was super deficient in nutrients. And they terminated him. They made him resign. Well, that put a lot of stress on him, right? And so he did things he'd been fantasizing for years, apparently. And the psychologists and psychiatrists who were dealing with him didn't think much of it because he'd been fantasizing about this type of mass murder violence for years. But when you put that added stress on him that he'd been rejected by his chosen community, of neurologists and essentially ended his career after many, many years of working it, uh, that put him over the top where a, somebody who is well nourished and reasonable, they might get ticked off and go get drunk that night, but they're not going to go out and kill you know, people. And so it does have a tremendous effect on our emotions, um, our diabetes, our heart disease, cancer will definitely drive cancer faster when you're under stress. And that's why I tell people to take the 90 essential nutrients, use our sports drink called Rebound to get 100 nutrients instead of drinking the sports drinks that have two nutrients in it. If you, whether you're playing sports or you're working in this place where you're sweating or you are just under financial stress or I shouldn't say just under failure, but somebody who's under financial stress and has heart disease and cancer, they're going to die many years or months sooner for sure because all these chemical things are happening in them. Uh, because of the fight or flight activity going on because of the hormone released by the body under stress. Okay, thank you very much. I really want to thank you for your continual and altruistic effort to inform the African American community about the prevention and reversal of disease that have plagued them for many, many years. Yet I hope that other Americans and people around the world hear the message you you have given and follow your advice. Thank you very much, Dr. Wallace. This CD is not intended to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any diseases. It is your responsibility to consult your personal health care practitioner prior to beginning any type of health and wellness program. Also, ask the person that gave you this CD for more information about Dr. Wallach and his nutritional products. Thank you for listening to this presentation. And remember to contact the person that sent this to you. For more presentations and books that go into greater detail, go to docwallachmedia.com and be well. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. The opinions expressed in this informational program are the express opinions of Joel D. Wallach, B.S. D.V.M. N.D., are not a replacement for proper medical advice and treatment. In all cases, we recommend you contact your physician directly regarding any medical conditions.